Cowboy you're about to be a part of. Save a little bit. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Stephen Colbert. I am so excited. I just flew in from Dagobah, and boy, are my S foils locked into a tap position. And if you don't understand what I just said, what are you doing here? Now, you might be saying to yourself, wait, what is Stephen Colbert doing at the Episode 9 panel? I know he is a lifelong fan of Star Wars, but doesn't he do a TV show five nights a week in New York City? Doesn't he have a show tonight? How could he be here? Well, let me ask you this. Am I really at this panel right now? <laughs> Isn't it just as likely I'm in lotus position on the roof of the Ed Sullivan Theater? Force projecting myself onto the stage right now? Go ahead, try to strike them down. <laughs> he tried. I will become more powerful than you could ever imagine. Also, and this is very important, do not try to strike me down, because I might actually be here and that would hurt. I also do have a security force with me, at least one of them is a no green. <laughs> Again, if you don't know what that means, why are you here? <laughs> We know Star Wars isn't just a movie, or a cartoon, or a Christmas special, <laughs> or a breakfast cereal, or a soap dispenser, or a, or a Pez dispenser. It's, it's not even just an ice mold that makes one giant cube in the shape of a Death Star that makes your cocktail very fun. <laughs> yes, it's all those things, but it's not just that. It's also a place. It's a universe where we go to get lost, to get inspired, to feel understood, to feel like anything is possible. Forty years in, more expansive and diverse than ever any of us can imagine being that young kid on Tatooine, about to take our first step into a larger world. I was once that kid, and on my best days, I still am. Now, two months ago, my friend, J.J. Abrams, we compadre, my soul cycle emergency contact. He called me up and he said, well, Steve, would you do me a favor? And I said, of course. Why? Because again, he's my friend, and I like to repeat that every so often. <laughs> he's also a creative genius who understands the spirit and the joy of science fiction. And perhaps most importantly, because he let me visit the episode 9 set. <laughs> I know things. <laughs> oh, the things I know. I got to go in the thing, and I saw the place where they were, with the people you remember from that place. And you're not going to believe the new things for them, theys, who usually have other things. But then, now they have a new one. This is going to be so much more exciting, and we can use nouns. <laughs> Of course, we're here today to talk about episode 9, the movie that completes the Skywalker saga. So, let's get this thing started. It is my pleasure to introduce the president of Lucasfilm, Kathleen Kennedy. Open the present. 
you know, the thing I think about all the time is the responsibility we have. And we have it with all of you, and it's something that we talk about every minute that we're involved in making these movies. And this one in particular. I think the little film you saw at the front end, George was saying that this is the third act of a three-act structure. It is. That's exactly what it is. And we've immersed ourselves in everything George created, talked about it endlessly, and we're so excited because I think what you're going to end up seeing, you're going to be so happy with. We are incredibly excited. And this guy sitting next to me, he cares more than anybody I know. Well, first of all, uh, thank you all for coming. This is unbelievable to, to be here. Uh, I have to say, uh, in answer to your, your question, Stephen, uh, hello. Uh, in answer to your question, I, I think that, um, but, but I love you also. Uh, that, that the thing is that, that at this stage, we've been so sort of in that, in that focused cave of the editing room and working so, so hard with a very small group of people. And you're aware, of course, what Star Wars means to so many outside of those, those rooms. But to come here and to have this kind of warm reception and to be physically, viscerally reminded of what it means uh, is the most amazing and exciting shot in the arm. And like Kathy said, uh, we cannot wait for you to see uh, what we're coming up. Okay, so with that, in mind, with that in mind, where are you in production right now? Uh, well, we're, we're, we're editing and we're doing you know, visual effects. When you, when you wrap a movie like this, uh, as you all uh, know and can imagine, uh, the directing doesn't stop, the, the, the slow pitch is not. So you keep, they actually love each other. They love each other. You know, it's the greatest thing in the world. Um, the, uh, the process continues, and so we're, we're editing and things are uh, going pretty well so far. Well, uh, Kathy, as you were saying, this is, this is the, uh, the final movie of a nine-movie arc. What, what's that like? There, that's unprecedented in, in, in filmmaking, to have this one story, you know, over this period of time. As you said, the third, uh, a three, three-act uh, plays, as it were. Yeah, it is, and I, I think that what's also fascinating is it's over 40 years. So the context that George was working within, it's 40 years later, and to keep this relevant and meaningful to the characters and to the people experiencing this story, it has to feel like it's of its time. And I think that what we've done is we've taken to heart everything that inspired George. And then I think the inspiration that JJ has brought to this has given it even more depth. Also, this, uh, this movie, in addition to being the end of three trilogies, uh, it, it also needs to work as its own movie. Uh, and that's been part of the, the fun of it, part of the challenge of it. Uh, but this movie, it's about this new generation and, and what they've inherited. The, the light and the dark, and asking the question as they face the greatest uh, evil, are they prepared, are they ready? And uh, it's been really incredible to look at this thing that George created and to bring it to a, a close in this way about this new generation. It is so hard to sit here next to you and hear you say the greatest evil without going, and who is? What is? Can you give us any hint? Kathy? <laughs> I was lucky enough. I was lucky enough to to meet, interview Carrie Fisher a few times, and and, and there's I even the little bit I knew Carrie Fisher. I know there's fundamentally no way to replace her as a person or as that person playing the character of Princess Leia. Um, how, how did you how did you approach filling the void left by Carrie? In this in this movie, um, well, a, a, as I've said, we we couldn't. 
and as Chris Terrio, the, the co-writer, and, and, and Kathy and Michelle Reshmont, producers, we all talked about how to move on. I mean, she was the best. She was glorious. She was amazing. Uh, you know, uh, and, and, and we all we all just loved her. And I, I knew her for many years before as well. Uh, episode seven. She she was she was the greatest. It it, it was impossible. There was no way. What are you going to do? You don't recast that part, and you don't suddenly have her disappear. And the weird miracle of having had a number of scenes from uh, Force Awakens that had gone unused, looking at those scenes and starting to understand that there was actually a way to use those scenes to continue her story so that it would, it would be her. The idea of having a CG character was off the table. We never even want to try. And the idea of saying, well, what if we could actually write scenes around her? So it would be her performance, she's in the movie. And the crazy thing is, and I say this, um, like emotionally, I, it's it's it, it's every day it hits me that she's not here. But it, it's so surreal because we're working with her still. If that makes sense, she's in scenes. She's so alive in scenes. And the craziest part is how not crazy it feels. Because she she is there in these scenes. Um, in some scenes with with Billy, her daughter, who was in the movie as well. And it's just. Princess Leia lives in this film in a way that is um, kind of mind-blowing to me. What, what are some of the differences you can, like what are some of the new things in this film you can share with us? Um, when last we saw the cast, they were all spread out. Um, you know, that when those stories ended, they were not together, they had been split up. Are, are, are they, do we pick up exactly where we left off? Can you tell us anything about how far the stories have progressed? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what I will say is that, uh, that the, the, the movie doesn't pick up immediately after uh, the last film. Uh, some time has gone by. And what I'll say is that in this movie, uh, and you can tell by that, that picture, uh, it, it's the very beginning of it. But this is a, 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 a an adventure that the group goes on together. And this is... Yeah. And it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's a story that I, I think... Uh, one, of the, one of the great things about the... One of the great things about the movie, uh, getting to work on it, was the dynamic between the characters. They are... Uh, they are just the most wonderful together, and that's the thing I'm sort of most excited for you all to see. What about uh, what about uh, your use of uh, CGI versus practical effects or locations, or like is there is there um can you talk about that at all? Thanks. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, uh, the, I want to tell you so much, but I will say this: that 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 as with uh, the, the Force Awakens, what we tried to do despite this being this epic space adventure that takes place on many <laughs> worlds and in, in many places, um, <laughs> that we, we did everything we could, uh, building sets, uh, exterior, exterior, uh, interior and exterior, going to locations um, in and around uh, in, in England and in Jordan and other places. We did everything we could to have it in camera. One of my favorite things as a kid, and I still remember that visceral feeling at 10 years old, you know, seeing, you know, looking at, at what I learned later was Tunisia, but it felt like you knew you were in a real place. It was, you know, and, and to one of the infinite number of brilliant strokes that George had was to tell this, the story in, in physical, actual, real locations. That's Jordan, uh, you know, the location. Wadi Rum. Wadi Rum, where they shot, you know, Lawrence of Arabia. You get there, you're just looking around, you can't believe what you're seeing. And it's amazing to have the, uh, the, the, the sort of that kind of beautiful nature uh, as a backdrop for sequences. Uh, so we tried to keep it as real as possible, as physical as possible. It was better for the actors, better for the movie. Kathy, what was, what was the last day of shooting like? You know, it was emotional, and I can't really give you details except to say that. <laughs> uh, all right. Remember, <laughs> were there a lot of people on set? Were there a few people? 
and said, yeah, there are a few. Just a few. <laughs> Oh I, oh, I get it now. You, you asked me to come to Chicago to ask questions, not get answers. <laughs> okay. Whew. All right, let's, uh, anything else you want to cover before I bring out some cast members? Work. Cast members. Cast members. All right, wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome C3PO Anthony Daniels and <laughs> I know we're on camera, so I don't know where the camera is, but whoever is in Australia or all the other countries around the planet, I want to give you a big wave and you're here in spirit, okay? <laughs> so yes, one of the things about, you will notice about Fabio is he is the voice of reason. I mean, you sing Kobe one you heard from us Fabio is the one who tells you that you're in danger. You should get out of there, yes? And what does everybody do in three trilogies of nine movies? They say, shut up. <laughs> well, I'm here to say, enough. <laughs> so I, I start... <laughs> when you return, when you return to playing 3PO, do you ever say to yourself, oh, I wonder if I'll still fit in it? <laughs> it's like a bride going it, back it to the wedding dress. It's totally like that. And on the first fittings, generally, mm, a bit of squeeze. But then I'm back in the gym, look at that. I'm on a diet, whatever, and I squeeze back in. Because if I don't... <laughs> what is really scary in that wonderful little pre-show history film you showed, it had a picture of me with hair as black as JJ's. <laughs> Be warned, JJ. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, being three girl has all sorts of parameters to it, you know. But I, I just love the guy, so I, I've got to tuck inside there somewhere. If, if 3PO was real and you could purchase one... Excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> I know it was, it was available, no longer available, a discontinued model a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. If 3PO was still under production, if, uh, would you want your own 3PO unit? Are you crazy? <laughs> Look, things like Alexa and Siri terrify me. <laughs> I was once a sat nav for the car. Yeah. And next roundabout, turn left, take the fifth exit, shut up! <laughs> How did I know? Well, that was true. I actually had to turn myself off. <laughs> and I was ready every morning for another movie really set. <laughs> what I want 3PO, I would want, uh, I regard 3PO as, as my best, best friend in, in many ways. And I would genuinely want a best friend who cared for me as much as 3PO does. I, I, all of this is exciting to me. All of the, I, I can't believe I get to be on stage with C3PO. I, I can't believe I'm on stage with you three. I mean, look at this. This is a fan fest all of our own. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I, you, I you have a book. Uh, that's being announced tomorrow. You can't give us the, the title of the book, okay? 
right? Right. Can't give us the title. Right. But can you give us the title that you wanted to give the book <laughs> that your editor said the audience wouldn't understand? He said the public won't understand worldwide. They won't understand. I was very hurt. I came up with this really cute title, and they said, "No, nah, won't work." What was the title? Well, actually, would it be a scientific experiment? Sure. They said you would never understand. <laughs> Are you ready? Yes. If you understand the title of my memoirs of Star Wars, and you get it, will you cheer? If you think indeed it was a num num title and you don't get it, you boo. Are you ready? And the other people, are you ready? <laughs> and the people up in the cheap seats, are you ready? <laughs> the title of my memoirs was Teddy in the Odds. <laughs> which you will see at 11.30 tomorrow, and I will tell you that I actually do like their title as well. <laughs> All right, let's bring out uh, our, our next cast member. Um, uh, the long-awaited, much-beloved, Landau Calrissian. <laughs> Making money. 
but uh, don't get me wrong, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, just to be able to hang out, play around with ideas, and, and with people like you, Monsieur, and JJ. <laughs> well, speaking of money, Lando is experience. not entirely a bad guy, and he's not entirely a good guy either. Like, the last time we saw him, yes, he's, he's, he's Han's friend, and he comes to the, to the rescue, but he's, he's a little bit of a lovable scoundrel at the same time. Is he the same guy? There's a thing called expediency. Oh, expediency. You know, um, when you're in a situation, especially when you're up against somebody like a Darth Vader, uh, you have to, and you and you own what is pretty much like owning Las Vegas. <laughs> uh, you're like a Steve Wynn, you know, kind of an entrepreneur. Uh, and you have this kind of threat. Here's a guy chasing after it, Boba Fett's chasing after it. I have to explain this stuff to people. I don't understand why. <laughs> you, you don't have to explain it. I, you know, I, I get sick and tired of being accused of betraying Han Solo. <laughs> <laughs> Never gonna let it down. No, it's like first person singular. You know, all of a sudden I'm talking about me. <laughs> Lando Calrissian, but anyway, he was up against Dr. Barry, but he had to figure something out. Wait, did anybody die? He played right. He played right. He rolled the dice and he won. So, you know, I had to figure out how to, to, to uh, prevent the complete demise of my friend and his friends. So, really, in retrospect, the hero of all nine movies, Lando <laughs> Carrillo. <laughs> all right, exciting. Well, we have, we have more cast members to introduce now. It's my pleasure to introduce the Next Generation cast. Please welcome Daisy Ridley. And my dad was in the house, and I like yelped, 
my dad ran up the stairs and he just sat at the end of my bed and he just had his hands like on his mouth and I like open eye sobbed. I was just I was sobbing but then my best friend was sleeping downstairs and I couldn't tell nobody so I had to just like I went down and made a cup of tea and I was like you're right there everything's cool like, yeah, just, like, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was incredible it was mind blowing this is this is mind blowing what did your dad say when you told him my dad, my dad was telling me to shush because I was talking too loud on the phone. So he was more telling me to, to be quiet so that my best friend wouldn't be here. Um, but he's, yeah, he's, he, so he knew from the beginning. Sorry, JJ. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't know, we don't know anything about your character yet. We don't know your character, we don't even know your character's name. Can she reveal the char oh, yeah. character's name? Thank you. Her name is Jana. <laughs> Uh, no, no, I don't think so. 
Yeah. It seemed like there might have been a, a, a little bit of a love triangle going on with Finn and Ray and Rose. Um, you, you add Poe there as well. Um, <laughs> We've got a few aliens that have been looking at Finn as certain type of ways. I don't know if they want to add their names to the list. Uh, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a love pentagon, man. It's just... It's just the galaxy's most eligible back. I think he is, period. Period, point back. Um, Finn, Finn, is, Finn is single and willing to mingle, so... Uh, <laughs> You did that, man. We're gonna go there. You did that to me. There was so much goodwill a second ago. You <laughs> just burned it in front of my eyes. <laughs> Alright, but no one, no one can pilot the Millennium Falcon like Han. No one. However, <laughs> Poe is very, he can literally fly anything. I'm just saying Poe is the better Uber driver. <laughs> I'm not sure if I could enjoy this movie more than I'm enjoying watching you enjoy these photographs, right? <laughs> That's a high bar. Uh, now, you were born in uh, Guatemala, raised in Miami. <laughs> that is Miami, 305. <laughs> Cuban father, so Cuban Guatemala. Star Wars has been translated into every language on the planet. What's it like to impress around the world when you're able to speak to the Spanish-speaking uh, press in their own language about the films? Like, how, how would you describe Poe or this film in, 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 in Spanish? Well, it's, it's, it's just like this, but in Spanish. <laughs> like, Very similar. Is Star Wars, uh, forgive my ignorance, is Star Wars, Star Wars in Spanish? Or uh, no, it's Star Wars. <laughs> Guerra de las Galaxias. Which means? Uh, well, actually, I guess like that War of the Galaxy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's Pebocho. <laughs> and, uh, and your buddy is uh, Arturito. <laughs> Little Arthur. Now, Poe is always uh, cracking a joke in the darkest moment. Uh, whether it's you know, taking on a dreadnought and an X-wing, or being interrogated to Kylo Ren, is everything a joke to him? <laughs> Why won't he take? <laughs> I think he takes his love for Finn very seriously. <laughs> very seriously. He's a human. You know, he's. I mean, he's. He has no real special powers. Yes, he's a great pilot, but deep down he's just a human. I think one of the most human things you can do is find the irony and the humanity in even the most crazy, darkest moments. I think that that's a, that is an element of the Force. Human. Uh, Poe was born into war. He was from Yavin 4, the planet the original Death Star uh, tries to destroy in Episode 4. And his parents both fought the Empire. Let's say the war ends one day. What's Poe do uh, after the war is over? What's his fault? Uber seems like a good, good place to go. Uh, space Uber? Yeah, Space Lift. I don't know, you know, it's true. He's a bit, he, he seeks a bit of that adrenaline, so he'll have to find it somewhere.
Has Ray read the books she took from the tree library? <laughs> I'm just telling. I mean, as we saw, those books are pretty large. She may have got started. How far through? Who knows? I don't know if we've talked about the portion of time it's been since the last one. Um, How long has it been since the last yeah. one? Yeah. Have, have we said? It's been a, it's been a little while. So she's getting. I guess she's getting through. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't have them on audible, she can't just listen to the voices. That would be fantastic. <laughs> In yoga sentences, so you're always sort of trying to figure out what it meant. Well, uh, Ray has crazy strong force powers now, but her lightsaber's in pieces. Is she rebuilding that lightsaber, or are we in a start from scratch situation here? Well, um, my answer is not the end of the story, because there are many more months to come that have gone to come. But um, the lightsaber that Ray inherited from Luke lives. Are there any, and I'm sure you can't tell me what they are, are there any new force powers that we were not aware of before? that appear. For instance, we were uh, thrown for a delightful loop on the force projection of Luke at the end of episode 8. Is there any new things that Ray is going to pull on us that, like, is she going to be able to pull down a Star Destroyer with her mind? Is she, can she, can she force flow through time? Is there, is there, you don't have to give us, but is there any new tricks? Um, this it's a JJ question. <laughs> what are the tricks, JJ? I think that's a yes. I think that's a yes. You have to ask him. Uh, no, I, I used to love Daisy. Um, <laughs> love her. I thought she was awesome. Um, I'll say this. Uh, there are uh, some extraordinary things that the, the character and Daisy uh, did in this movie. And uh, among... This is what, um, and, and some of the things, you know, obviously we don't want to say anything at this moment, but I will say that some of the stuff that happened uh, was possible because we had this, the most incredible uh, stunt coordinator. Eunice! Eunice uh, Hart, who was just the greatest. And she uh, did remarkable work with uh, the entire cast. And some of the things that uh, you allude to will be seen. There she is now. Eunice, uh, she's the best. Anyway, uh, yes, there are some other things, and you'll uh, see it soon. Um, Daisy, what's up with um, Ray and Kylo Ren? <laughs> <laughs> or Rose and Finn? Woo! <laughs> or, uh, your point of view, what's going on here? Where's this relationship going? I guess the Kylo and Ray thing will have to wait and see. The, the Rose and Finn thing, I don't know, Finn. What do you think? <laughs> I mean, she's she my girl. No, she's my girl. Um, I guess it's uh, nice chemistry. It's nice chemistry all about. It's, it's the middle of war. We're trying to figure ourselves out. A lot of love you one day, I'm going to love you the next. This is a very distracting place to fall in love. I guess, Daisy, what I'm asking is, do you have any more uh, force uh, visions of him semi-naked? <laughs> <laughs> Let's sell some tickets right now. Let's sell some tickets. Um, I think I can confirm there are no more semi naked Kylos. Unfortunately. Only four. Only four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're taking up on that guy. <laughs> uh, since Adam's not here, can I ask a question? Anybody here might know. His, his chest in, in episode eight, did he wax? Because it's <laughs> <laughs> a is that a Brazilian? Why is there no? He's a big man, not one hair on his chest. Uh, when he turned around, it was as surprising to the crew, I think, as to everyone. He's a, he's a big man. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Talk to you about his lightsaber. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ellie Marie Tran.
you narrated the audiobook version of the novel that tells Rose's backstory, Cobalt Squadron? Yes, I did. Okay. Did getting to know your character in book form uh, give you more to bring into this film? Um, I had never done the audiobook before, and I, the thing I learned is that it's a very long process. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely, I mean, it's a lot of backstory with uh, Rose and Paige, her sister, so I think it definitely helps me uh, in this upcoming one, yeah. As a trained uh, mechanic, um, what, what do you think that Rose would think of the Millennium Falcon? <laughs> it's really cool. Uh, but universally regarded as a hunk of junk. Universally, universally regarded. Everyone that resistance staff thinks it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. Um, you, you kiss Finn again in this movie? <laughs> Listen, all I'm going to say is Finn's a very eligible bachelor. Much like John Boy, I'm mean, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that a yes or a no? And please say yes. I, I hope you say yes, or else I have a lot of fan fiction that goes in the shredder. <laughs> now, when we last we saw your character, where was she? She was in a coma. Yeah, asleep, taking a rest. I would like to do that too. <laughs> Can you tell me, JJ, if everybody we see on stage right now are, ends up together in this film? Can I tell you that? No. When you say they're going, on, they're going on this adventure together, yeah. does that include everyone we're seeing, including, including Kelly Green? Uh, I will say that, uh, uh, how dare you? <laughs> I, I, I'm not your, I am not your agent right now, I am your <laughs> agent right now. <laughs> Um, way to pit me against my friends. Um, I, I, I would say that uh, you have to see what happens in the thing, but I will say that uh, I, I was grateful to um, Brian Johnson for so many things that he did in a, the, 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 greatest, um, uh, the greatest for me was uh, casting Kevin Green. I believe it has been this way since 1977. So, no. I mean, and I just want to say, can we get a big applause for my mentor, Mr. Peter Mayhew? Yeah. If it wasn't for his unique physicality, I don't think Chewbacca would be as memorable, and I don't think we would be seeing him here today, uh, on, uh, you know, anticipating his uh, upcoming uh, uh, appearance in the film, because it, the character is just so beloved, and you guys have shown it with your t-shirts and, and, and the kind words uh, all throughout these five incredible years that I've become this... Uh, uh, transformed into this character, and I'm just so grateful for everyone who's been supportive. Let's go, Chewie! <laughs> Chewbacca is is sort of a duty at this point because when I was sitting in, in our living room carpet, wide-eyed, watching the, the the saga start, and and Luke drinking that blue milk and, and seeing <laughs> Chewbacca for the first time, I was sure that in this world there's a place for everyone, and that 
I have to show everyone that Chewbacca, and no matter how big or small you are, there's a place for you in this world, and that's what I believe. And, and finally, you know, what, what do porgs taste like? <laughs> they taste best fried. <laughs> I want to know what it was like shooting in Jordan. What was it like to be out there in the for all of this is a question for any of you. What was it like to be out there in that desert? And Anthony, compare that to Tunisia. What was Jordan like compared to Tunisia? Jordan was a, a truly remarkable experience. Uh, the first day driving out there on the set, it was my wife Christine who said, But this is Ralph McQuarrie's painting. The the backdrops, those stone faces that you're looking at. And I would get goosebumps every day we drove out 45 minutes from the hotel. And it was, oh, it sounds corny, it, it was beyond a privilege to be there. And remarkably, the desert put up with us. Every day it tried to gain itself back to cover the roads that were being built, put us in to say goodbye, no, enough, leave us alone. It was the most astounding setting to be in. And the Jordanian people, the Jordanian army, everybody there, really were part of part of our kind of family. It was a glorious experience. Uh, Kathy and Jiffy, how long were you guys in the desert? Well, actually, we had a crew there prepping um, for months prior to us arriving, and then we shot for about three weeks. <laughs> Where's the nearest bar, JJ? <laughs> no, no, Stephen, we were working. Um, <laughs> It, it was an amazing thing, and we did. We had hundreds of people in in unbelievable costumes that Michael Kaplan designed. We had incredible creatures that Neil Scanlon and, and, and his team designed. So to be there with literally hundreds of people and in the the heat of it, and having to take you know food breaks and bathroom breaks and prayer breaks and the whole thing. Uh, but we got through it and actually finished the day ahead of schedule, which was kind of fun. And sandstorm breaks. Remember that? There'd be times when uh, you'd see these big, huge red clouds coming over. We'd be in the middle of shooting, and everyone would have to take cover and go into tents and sometimes wait an hour or so for these huge sandstorms to blow over. Never thought I'd be in that. We, we saw a couple of uh, creature designs uh, just now. Can, can you tell us who they are? Can you show us are there any other creatures that you're going to show us? Um, there's a, a, a fun uh, character who just appears, uh, <laughs> who, whose name is Clog with a K. Uh, KLAV, uh, and he is a, a friend of the resistance and someone who actually, uh, it turns out, Chewie brought into the. There's no brother. Excellent. But there, there are so many. I, there were, when we did episode seven, I, I felt like um, it had been, there was no way to top what had been created uh, in terms of, of creatures. When you see this movie, you'll see that. that Neil and the whole creature team did it. Uh, it's an incredible thing what they've made, what they built. And the actors who performed them and, and puppeteered them is remarkable. Can I just say, uh, there's one particular creature roaming around on set that uh, I really uh, thought that was wonderfully made. Uh, and uh, it was my son uh, who got to visit the set. And uh, I'm just kidding. And uh, it, it was so lovely working on this film after becoming a father. Uh, to have my son, that's my son right there. And, and if you see the wonder, and he's not afraid of Chewbacca, he had a good time with this cast, and especially Daisy. Thank you so much for all the cast, for welcoming little Atos, whose name nobody can pronounce. <laughs> Just like mine to this uh, Star Wars experience. Thank you so much, guys, and uh, thank you. Uh, now, at the risk of, of, of pandering, uh, Star Wars fans are the greatest fans in the world. I know, because I, I am one of them. Um, I've been a Star Wars fan three weeks longer than any of you. <laughs> Look up online why that's true. That is true. That's true. <laughs> What's that? I would love to tell the story. It's my story. Yeah, it's in one second. Yes. 
It's very, it's very good story. So when I was in 1977, when I was 13 years old, local radio station was giving away tickets to this movie called Star Wars. Nobody knew what it was. And me and my friends called in, we're like the eighth caller, we got four tickets to go see Star Wars. Big blue tickets that you had to go to the local radio station to pick up the BTMA. 1250 on your AM dial. And, <laughs> and, and it, was, I, it was me, Keith Sargi, Haskell Fugenberg, and Haskell Fugenberg's mom, because somebody had to drive. <laughs> and we were handing, we handed the tickets in. We said, can we keep the tickets as we went in? Because we didn't know what it was, but it felt like it was special. Because there were big tickets, and it had the Death Star, and it had the, an x wing fighter sweeping up like that. And it said, Star Wars, what the hell was Star Wars? And we walked in, we sat down, and as soon as, a long time ago in the galaxy far, far away, it came on the screen. We got chills because we knew that, A, that was a, a unique way to look at science fiction, the futures of the past, and also it immediately set you in that fairy tale world. And then, of course, and no one knew what the hell was going on and everyone cheered. <laughs> we didn't know what we were in for. And then two hours later, we woke up Pascal's mom and said, movie's over. <laughs> 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 We got in the car, went home, and it was a full moon. And I know it was three weeks before because it was a full moon, and we all thought it was the Death Star falling. <laughs> and on Monday, when I got to school, we couldn't explain to anybody how everything was different now, <laughs> and that we had seen the future. So anyway, that's why I've been a fan three weeks longer than all of you. So. <laughs> but I'm sorry. I think he's got something to say. Um, yeah, uh, in this movie, um, BB-8 has uh, a, a new friend. Would you guys want to meet him? This is Dio. Yeah, this is Dio, and, and uh, this is yet another uh, incredible collaboration and, and creation of uh, Neil Scanlon and the, the Creature and Robotics team on the movie. I will say that when, when, we, when we did the film, uh, we never had Dio exists quite this way. There was uh, a rig and puppeteers and things. And like with the celebration last time, uh, these are different designs that we went through working on it. Um, but like the celebration last time with, uh, on episode seven, when BB-8 rolled out and we never had a BB-8 be able to roll out, uh, it's amazing what celebration uh, makes these uh, geniuses do, uh, force them to do. So this is really, uh, was built for you. Um, can we please show our appreciation to JJ and Kathy and the entire cast?
passed on all we know. A thousand generations live in you now. But this is your fight.